good evening all doctors uh, welcome all to today's uh, cme meet from takida so today's topic uh, we'll be seeing positioning of uh, biologics and ibd so myself is dr roshan medical science liaison for uh, takida and uh, so before starting the session just uh, i like to start with a small story so we all know that uh, the story of ibd so uh, just a recap of the story so in 1815 in what happened we have to know so a 42 year old uh, female who have been presented with uh, several months of bloody diarrhea and as well as with uh, fever so usually as a physician some of the physicians will be tending towards redirecting that point of time towards dysentery the to bacterial bacillary dysentery so but what happens is uh, one among the surgeon uh, that is uh, specifically sir samuel wilkes uh, what he did is after the patient have died he took upon the patient and did an autopsy also so during that autopsy he found that uh, the patient have been affected with the uh, transmural inflammation and ulceration of ileum and colon so that's how he named the term it as an ulcerative colitis so this is how the term ulcerative colitis has been came but now the again uh, this is the original paper from him also so we can read it upon also so this is how the ulcerative colitis came so this is a 200 year old story but still what is the difficulty what is the unmet need is the uh, diagnosis time the earlier treatment everything even though we started the treatment with the conventional therapy like uh, for past 50 years more than 50 years we have steroids uh, we have methotrexate we have amino salicylates everything but still the researchers has been going on still the various new molecules are coming up so why the questioning before going into positioning why the biologics have been introduced the question may be coming from your mind so the why is because for the benefit of the patient specifically. So what conventional therapies add adverse events? Because we should not burden the patient. Already the patient has been uh, burdened with IBD. So we should not burden the patient again with an uh, adverse event of uh, another uh, drugs also. So that's why the targeted therapy, that is a biologic therapy have been introduced. Several biologic agents have been introduced one among which is vedalizumab also so which is a ga gastric targeted drug also so uh, so de for the detailed discussion of this biologics in ibd uh, i like to welcome our today's speaker esteemed speaker dr arun sir sir is currently a senior consultant gastroenterologist at apollo hospital chennai sir is also an assistant professor in uh, uh, department of uh, digestive health and disease in kmc sir graduated mbbs from rajamuthaya medical college and dnb pediatrics from uh, indira gandhi institute in um, Pondicherry and D, uh, DM Gastro from uh, Stanley Medical College. Sar also completed fellowship on uh, US in uh, uh, SGPGI. Sar has been previously been associated with MMC, Child Trust, Chennai also. Sar is a uh, member of various uh, societies, uh, including uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology and European Society, as well as the American Society and Society of Gastrointestinal uh, Endoscopy of India. Sar have published various journals, uh, including in peer review journals. Uh, including uh, articles on uh, ulcerative colitis, liver cirrhosis, as well as the COVID-19, uh, how the uh, liver parameter changes in COVID-19 also Sarah's published, and Sarah's uh, various achievements in endoscopic ultrasound and pancreatic endotherapy, as well as the third, uh, third space endoscopic. Sarah's also a principal investigator and co-investigator in various clinical trials, and I have active interest in liver transplant patients, and also been a speaker in various state and national level conferences also. So with this introduction, what to you, sir, to Enlighten us how the positioning of biologics and IBD is in current scenario. Over thank you, you thank you very much, Dr. Roshan, for your brief wide introduction about me, and uh, thank you, team Check it out for giving me an opportunity to be in this forum. And I'll be sharing a screen with you all right now for a while. I think you can able to visualize my slides, I think so. Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. So, good evening, dear friends, senior consultants. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to be in this occasion to discuss after transit gap, once again, very key important scenario in which it's one of the challenging area, even for the best of gastroenterologists in India to tackle. Because as you all know, inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic entity 
which starts right from pediatric age group for most of the patient. And the disease even can go even up to 70 to 80 years that a bimodal age of presentation will be represented when you're going to think about your inflammatory bowel disease. And if you want to discuss about this inflammatory bowel disease, my intention right now with you all to breach your knowledge, to analyze a basic concept, what is the main basic pathophysiological aspects and how are you going to respond? And once you desire the patient to initiate on treatment, and how are you going to monitor and what are the various new regimens being tried when you're going to manage a patient with inflammatory bowel disease? This is what I would like to discuss with you all for the next 30 to 40 minutes in my area of discussion. And this is all the disclaimer slide. And apart from that, as you're well aware about the key area of inflammatory bowel disease is nothing but your ulcerative colitis as well as your Crohn's disease. If you're going to look into your ulcerative colitis, the lesion will be predominantly limited to your large bowel. And in case if you're going to represent your Crohn's, the lesion will be predominantly limited to the entire part of GA tract. It can start from your oral cavity and it can go anywhere till your anal region. It can start in your esophagus, your stomach, as well as your small bowel, as well as your large intestine, your terminal ileum. All those areas will be predominantly represented by your Crohn's and in ulcerative colitis will be predominantly by your large bowel. And apart from that, the area of involvement will be predominantly transmural when you're going to think in terms of your Crohn's and other presentation. So what is this inflammatory bowel disease? There is some sort of chronic inflammatory event which is going to happen in your gut. But what is the major mechanism, which most of the time is still hypothesized. There are many, many, it because of your gut uh, ubiosis, if it is not going to mention, and your gut dysbiosis, if it's going to get take on, and your genetic manipulation, your immunogenicity, if not going to maintain, and your autoantibody response. There are so many other pathological concepts to discuss about this IBD, but still there is no single proven entirety to confirm this is the main molecular trigger which is predisposing for your inflammatory bowel disease to develop has not been completely ascertained. Various hypothetical concepts being going on, but our area of interest to discuss with you the basic outline of what you're going to represent. As you all know, uh, the discussed, there are more than 6.8 million population are being represented by globally for your inflammatory bowel disease. And over a period of for the past two months, my experience with inflammatory bowel disease, more than 20 to 30 patients for the past two months we have seen, limited to mild to moderate or moderate to severe intensity. Why I would like to point out this, even in my single area of experience, I mean, looking into this wide area of representation. So you should avoid that. How many cases are being there reported globally? So there are many, many cases. This is one of the chunkly because it's not only about the disease manipulation, it's also because of uh, the treatment, the response, the cause, the familial issue, the burden, the long-term follow, the environmental strategies, the growth, development, so many other parameters will be affecting your gut in order to tackle this presentation in an effective way before we are going to conclude this event. And this is what the basic pathogenesis of your IBD as we all know that there's a genomic factor or your environmental exposures of triggers which will predispose to your immune dysfunction and the chronic inflammation. It could be mild or moderate or severe in which you can able to identify endoscopic severity or histological severity or clinical severity. Always you need to represent three major areas in gastroenterology. Clinical assessment is very important. What is the characteristic presentation, IBD? The patient may lose weight. Characteristically, the patient may have abdominal pain, which will be prominent possibility in small bowel environment like Crohn's. And the patient may have tenismus, which is predominant possibility for the patient if you're going to suspect your UC. And the patient may have evidence of your bloody diarrhea, which is characteristic predominantly will be for your ulcerative colitis, but also case reports also being there in evidence of your Crohn's also depends upon the area of involvement. And predominant right-sided involvement, colon and terminal ileal involvement will be restricting to your Crohn's and multiple complications like stricture formation, fistulizing lesion, and perianal complications. So many other lesions will be reporting mainly because of your Crohn's and other disease entirety, but your inflammatory bowel disease Youth limitations of extra GA manifestations along with that also for your Crohn's disease. 
See, head to foot assessment is very important. Taking a good clinical history is important. By before uh, doing a basic endoscopic and basic lab parameters to look into your inflammatory cascade and other events like your calprotectin, your lactoferrin, your CRP, US, ESO, and your basic blood parameters, your platelet levels, your thrombocytosis, all these basic things you need to have a clinical assessment and clinical extra taking for your various presentation of the area of abdominal pain, where the pain being located, and the predominant presentation of stools, whether the diarrheal event, which is being bloody or frank blood, worsening of events, acute severe colitis, like if the patients have severe diarrheal events, fever, liquocytosis, if the patients have tachycardia, high respiratory rate, if the patient is going for early signs of a systemic inflammatory response, that shows the evidence of acute severe colitis at the point of juncture. You need to be very cautious. You need to hospitalize the patient, giving IV medication, steroids, or whatever the things you are going to use. Based upon your huge amount of is there in the management protocol for you to consider. But it's a long-term follow. The induction treatment is important. The response has to be ascertained to diagnose your Crohn's as well as your IV, I mean, ulcerative colitis promptly in an effective way. So once a chronic inflammatory cascade been checked on, there might be evidence of CD as well as your UC may be the predominantly by your T L P cell response, what is going to the uh, immune response is going to get activated in your gut. That's the main area for you to identify your inflammatory cascade is that to take on. Apart from that, what was the basic cause? So to brush up the knowledge on your basic cause, so the remission of the initial activity as per your Norwegian group of members who have been studied in this area, once the initial activity been happening in any case of ulcerative colitis or a period of years, there will be remission after initial activity will be around 40 to 50 percentage and the severity will be continuously peaking will be around one percentage and chronically it will go on, it will come down, go on, come down like that for five percentage and intermittent phase will be around 33 percentage of the population. You need to look into this based upon the study and 50 percent of you see we potentially will be having an unfavorable, unfavorable disease outcome. So, as you all know, Crohn's disease is usually progressing because of your Vienna classification. If you look into that, it can be cicatrizing, it can be structurizing, penetrating. It's a progressive condition. You need to look into that. So, progress, progressive damage to your intestinal tract and the inflammatory cascade, which is going to predispose, will be having the prime, even the disease onset, the diagnosis, the severity indices, and your CRP, all those things you need to ascertain when you want to look into this uh, pathophysiological aspect promptly. Apart from that, if you're going to see this, the patient may have a structurizing, as I discussed with you, fistulizing lesion, most of the time, perianal abscess formation, and fistulizing, even if you and very complex fistula will be the most of the time in Crohn's and the placement of sit on and other things, no adherence have been going on. But surgical indication, you need to be very, very cautious. The role of <clears throat> monoclonal antibodies has been going very high when you're going to look for this kind of fistulizing lesion, along with the surgical indication and structurizing complication, for example, your ileal stricture and other organ complications will be the will be most of the time, even patient may present with evidence of gastric outlet obstruction sometimes. So all these things, structurizing lesion may have evidence of your Crohn's. So you need to be very, very cautious to deal with this kind of presentation. And the cumulative risk of structurizing or penetrating complications for your Crohn's, if you're going to see this. Uh, paper which is going from which has been taken from Mayo Clinic. So, what is the cumulative probability of years of, of Crohn's diagnosis? The penetrating of complications as the years progress, around 50% of the patients will be having worsening of events as day progress. So, you need to be very conscious, tackle the patient, patient in the initial phase, recognizing the initial manifestation and uh, controlling the inflammatory cascade at the earlier point and preventing the complications will be most important when you're going to tackle and counsel the patient is most important when you're going to address this kind of scenario. What is the basic treatment goal? So first of all, we need to give a clinical response. You need to show the response, the patient pain has to subside, abdominal bleeding symptoms has to reduce, the tennis mass has to improve, nutritionally the patient's supposed to do good, the patient's supposed to put weight. This is the basic things we need to do when the when you're going to target with some molecule, most of the time, the cost will be high, you need to be on long-term follow-up, 
and along with vaccination, so many other strategies you need to maintain and the relieving or relieving of symptoms is the most important thing and steroids. Nowadays, you all know my brother, intravenous steroids, oral corticosteroids, or topical steroids, so many other line of preparation are there. You will list in the armamentarium, starting from your burisonide to hydrocord and prednisone and other molecules, and you're going to consider the rate of around 40 to 60 milligrams per day, even for the patient. For a period of two to three months of duration of therapy, if you're going to give monitoring for multiple other complications, like a steroidal complication, starting from head to four, multiple complications. For example, your can track, your head, your, I mean, your bone density may go down, your other complications, and adrenal separation. So many other events will be there when you're going to tackle with CDR. So addressing that. Apart from that, butazonide, mind to moderate severity, you can consider for your IBD, but that's a separate line of interest to discuss. And our main motive to prevent the surgical intervention, because most of the time I have seen recently a patient who presented to me in the background of inflammatory bowel disease, a young girl, just 23 years completed active severe colitis. I accounted the patient, but the patient underwent treatment to some extent, but financial constraints, she couldn't able to progress much, and we couldn't able to save the life which she succumbed with coexisting tuberculosis at that point of presentation. Once you are going to initiate the patient with steroids and other complications, so many other various infections may report. So addressing the patient, tackling the effect uh, patient in an effective way. These are all the things is very, very important. And recognizing the complication and uh, recognizing the infections is very important when you're going to manage a patient with inflammatory bowel disease that two period over a period of time. And next one is we need to yield the mucosa and we need to limit the disability. Disability in the sense physical, not only physical, the mental disability. Financial constraints, the patient will be disabled, the patient quality of life will go down, family life may go down, active interventions may go down, all those things. So limit the disability in all the spheres of quadrants, what are the things is going to get involved. And we need to make sure, we need to improve the quality of life to some extent with this kind of patient. That's the main intention for us to tackle with this kind of presentation. As you all know, this is, uh, if you're going to see erythematous, afters, exudative lesions in this picture, this is scattered throughout the colon most of the time. And sometimes we may see evidence of polypoid, pseudopolypoid presentation, blistering, exudative lesions will be there. So we need to be very characterized. Like if we need a colon like this, but not like this when you're going to tackle with this kind of presentation. So raising the bar. So what is the evolving therapeutic goals? As you all know, starting from your basic molecule, for example, from your ASA, and next to that, your steroids, your TNF inhibitors, your monoclonal antibodies, now integrins, now new newer concepts have been going on. So all those things, the basic picture, clinical, endoscopic, as well as your histological response has to be there. That is the main motive for you to address this event. And apart from histological remission, your endoscopic, your symptomatic improvement and histological healing is potentially the ultimate treatment goal when you're going to target your inflammatory bowel disease effectively. And the symptom of your inflammation and you know inflammatory task and all those things supposed to be uh, uh, initiated in a proper way when you're going to address. So what is the basic sequencing of your therapy when you're going to consider why does you need to sequence the patient for your inflammatory bowel disease? Because as I discussed, clinical plus endoscopic remission is very, very important. And is usually you cannot able to achieve for most of the patients. And for all the patients, you cannot able to achieve all the response. Very, very importantly, whenever you're going to put a molecule, we need to counsel the patient. Suppose if you're going to start the patient on steroids, the patient not responding, and you need to step up the molecule with a higher line of monoclonal antibody. For example, if you're going to start the patient on infliximab or adalimumab support at that point of time, you need to counsel the financial issues, the infection possibility, the risk of malignancy, the various other coexisting presentation, all those things you need to counsel, monitor, tackle, based upon the clinical needs, you need to address serial follow, and we need to do a endoscopic remission as well as clinical response, histological response has to be maintained when you're going to tackle with this kind of molecules for a duration. So sequencing matches a lot in your inflammatory bowel disease cascade. We need to show the three major area of remission based upon your disease activity in lasers, which is being for ulcerative or Crohn's disease and various classifications, what, being, what are the things being in use. 
as you all know, you 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 list of molecules starting from your amino modulators, your steroids, and your ASA component for your, for the basic prototype. Your mesalazine, or balsalazine, and oxalazine. What are the molecules you're going to give? For a duration max up to 4.8 grams per day, when you're going to think about that, so the response, so the duration of time, either you're going to give oral or topical line of therapy to rectal, the penetration based upon the various preparations are there. Uh, so the basic thing about your AC, you should not forget that. Some papers have been reported to have even a chronic fibrosis and other complications over a period of time when you're going to use. Apart from that, only complete initiation basic mind to moderate to some extent will be a respond responsive phenomena but once a patient is going for severe cascade at the point of time tackling only with your mesalazine will not go into helpful at the point of time and the patient may deserve eye line of molecules eye line of medications and I and steroids and other medications to be considered in the armament when you're going to tackle a patient with inflammatory bowel disease and this is all the protocol and antibiotic usage. And most of the time, the patient will be having coexisting infection sometimes, and the patient may present with evidence of pseudomembranous antibiotic associated colitis. At that point of time, you need to be very, very cautious to tackle with that kind of presentation. And main thing is, what is the basic treatment outline that what I've been discussed with you? Steroids, amino salicylates, immunosuppressants, based upon your purine-based analog, as well as bring all those things you can consider. Just a minute. Then you're going to address this kind of presentation. But the most important thing, what you would like to suppose you need to follow, to whom you're going to use is important. And when you're going to give a steroid, when you're going to taper the dose of steroids, you need to start the patient sometimes with your azotheaparine like molecule. And whenever you're going to start the patient with azotheaparine, you need to monitor the patient, whether the patient is responding or not, the counts are maintaining or not, your total counts and other things you need to monitor. Your, which means your response for azotheaparine, like your TPMT assay, your 6 thyroid and assay, all those things you need to do the basic things whenever you're going to see whether the patient is responding or not. But the basic cascade is limitation of inflammation for all those things is mechanism and down regulation of your inflammatory cytokines for your steroids. And when you're going to use your immunosuppressive, it is going to use the down regulate your anti-inflammatory cascade. <coughs> so it is going to interfere with your cell proliferation and it is going to inhibit your T cell proliferation and your interleukin transcription and other factors. So the basic indication will be your start with your EAC as well as your steroids with the patient not responding. And doesn't mean all the patients need to consider that. Always depends upon the clinical presentation and the severity of involvement directly. You can switch on to a higher line of molecules like your monoclonal therapy. Apart from that, doesn't mean you need to stick on only with the basic protocol. Depends upon the clinical presentation you need to address to whom you are going to tackle, what are the various infections you are going to address, whether the patient is going to take vaccination, all those regimens is very, 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 very important. And tackling with your chain of help for antagonists, as it mean you, this traumatic was being considered and starting from your infliximab to your golimumab and now apart from that, your adalimumab. So if you're going to think about this, starting from 10 milligrams or five milligrams of infliximab and over a period of 52 weeks of every eight weeks interval, you can give a maintenance. And adalimumab, if you're going to consider, you can start with 160 milligrams, four wires of bolus, and then you can mention with 80 milligrams over a period of time. And then you can maintain with 40 milligrams subsequently, every fortnightly, and then you need to follow the patient sometimes for years and we need to maintain. So this is what the problematic area, the cost, the issues, the financial constraints, apart from that various malignancy risk factors and your infection risk factors, vaccination protocols, all those things, your, for example, your CMV, EBV, and your Episimplex virus, your tuberculosis is very common even, all those things you need to monitor. That is a difficult area for gastro, even for the best of gastroenterologists to tackle this inflammatory bowel disease and to recognize this presentation in a short area within a 30 minutes of period to brush up the knowledge is the key intention for me to do on this with this event. But so usually the uh, effectiveness for induction in maintenance of remission in Fleximab usually well approved for fistulizing lesions and you're going to use for your Crohn's. And apart from that, this is the basic 
chain of progression of your various therapeutic regimens starting from your infliximab and your higher generation of molecules like your I mean, vedalizumab as well as your chicken above when you're going to consider and vedalizumab if you're going to use you can give it a dose of 300 milligrams and subsequently over a period of six weeks and depends upon the clinical presentation and you can give a booster apart from that uh, over a period of every six to eight weeks of interval, you can give for the period of subsequent uh, 52 weeks of time, you can give Verilizumab safely. And usually, <clears throat> usually for the induction regimen of CD, it's not well recommended, but you can maintain now with your UC as well as for CD with your Verilizumab support. Apart from Verilizumab and Infliximab, the data are well known. And the new molecules like your Tafasitni, Basilis, your Chikinumab have been tried, but the main thing is to talk about your vedalizumab to block the pathway of your intergrain antagonist like your alpha 4, beta 7. And what is going to happen? It is going to have a gut specific anti inflammatory effort. So it is going to interfere with the ability of your inflammatory immune response cells to adhere and to cross to the endothelium, crossing the endothelium. And the key attributes always IV dosing, effective in induction and maintenance of remission and the lower incidence of infection, the indication may be for your UC as well as your CD. And apart from other molecules like your chicken above, your cytokine blockage, and JAK, JNS activating kinase inhibitor, now the facet will be well recognized now for the moderate severe, but there are some papers to prove that even for the severe conditions, along with your other purine analogs and other support, you can give the facet for the patient, but Isolated molecule of it is going to respond for severe cascade. It's still a questionable issue. So that's why most of the time intravenous, I mean, your <clears throat> intravenous based regimen being considered like verilizuma when you're going to manage a patient with uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, that too, when you want to maintain in the phase for longer duration of time. When choosing a first line biology, consider a plan for lifelong treatment. So most of the time, the treatment protocol will be for chronic presentation, will be for lifelong counseling matters. So our intention to control the inflammation, no worsening of symptoms, as I told you, mucosal healing, your fitness, your metabolic reserve, as well as your cardiac health and your quality of life. This, all these things to be addressed promptly when you want to manage this kind of presentation. But what factors should be considered when you're going to choose your first line of biologic? Thus, first line biologic therapy affect your efficacy of subsequent treatments. Sure, you need to address it promptly when you're going to tackle this thing. Does your first line of biologic therapy as a right target of your disease pathophysiology? Definitely, we need to address that. How does the safety profile of your therapy influence a patient acceptance of treatment? And considering a, yeah, a specific mechanism of action of first line of molecule therapy impact efficacy of your subsequent treatment, all those things you need to answer when you're going to start your molecules. That's what the main intention for this slide should be progress. Apart from that, how does sequencing matter in the patient in context of a patient's lifelong treatment? So sequencing, assessing is important and do this is duration and this is severity impact efficacy of treatment, definitely. Because this is severity is very important. And how far the disease is being presented, and when you are going to see, most of the time the patient will be seen by the physician, the practitioners who are being tackling with the basic molecules, tackling like acute gastroenteritis or something like. And once the patient is landing up with the evidence of your nutritional deprivation, worsening of events, your evidence of anemia and other complications, at that point you will be coming to know that. And I have seen some patients who just present with extra GA manifestation. For example, the patient may have pyroma skin lesion. The patient may present to you with evidence of only jaundice with me, a coexisting presentation. And uh, some patient may present only with joint pains like ankylosing spondylitis, your joint swelling, your ankle joint predominantly. These are all the areas you need to be sacroiliatic. So these are all the area you're not supposed to forget. You list of armamentarium, ocular lesions, one paper is being reported, only with ocular lesion. So all those things you need to see assessing the patient as a whole at the full recognition and answer the questions properly when you're going to start the patient in biologics. That's what is most important when you're going to consider a patient with long-term support for your inflammatory bowel disease. As I discussed, basic concepts well known, starting from your this, your pyramid chart, always for any gastroenterological, for any chronic condition, stepping up and stepping down is important. 
not only for this, even for your peptic cells and other complications, you should remember the chart, you should remember the area of progression. That is very important when you're going to check it. So for mild, moderate, or severe, so our area starting from 5-ASA, your prednisone, butisonide, mild to moderate, your butisonide to some extent, but severity always go with prednisolone. Apart from that, moderate severity, adding on azathioprine, considering the patient not responding to methotrexate, but man monitor the patient for bone marrow response. Apart from that, your severity along with liver, tax, liver toxicity. Apart from once the patient is going for severity, worsening of lesions, biologics or surgery, or whether the patient even for the moderate severity directly are going to start for biology, depends upon the age of presentation, involvement of the lesion, how severe is the lesion, coexisting presentation, as I discussed when you're going to start. So these are all the things you need to answer. The subgroup usually will be benefited by your strategies is your younger age, your early structuring, a penetrating uh, disease, uh, extensive small bowel involvement more than 100 centimeter, a complex perianal fistula. This is all the area you need to identify the earlier potential itself, and then we can consider the patient strongly with biological support to prevent further, further onset or further late complications of events to, to prevent the progression. So, Step of therapy is always the most important one when you're going to consider and which doesn't going to alter the disease pattern or progression or prevent long-term complications, long-term disease, even as well as the complications to get happen. Apart from that, the basic thing of your biologic response, the benefits and risk. So the change in paradigm shift in the management of the condition indications predominantly your moderate to severe Crohn's, your fistulizing Crohn's, moderate to severe UC, extra GA manifestations, as well as you need to consider with the dermatologist is a multidisciplinary approach, ocular team, rheumatic team, ortho team, sometimes multidisciplinary team may be involved to tackle this kind of presentation. Once a patient is going to land up with evidence of extra GA manifestations or dermatological lesions also. And highly effective in achieving your clinical remission and but always the biological therapy some adverse events always to be addressed as I discussed with you, infections and malignant risk and changes to be promptly recognized. Apart from that, immunogenicity also to be addressed when you're going to use for a duration of time. And as I discussed, biologics has been taking a separate role. It has been revolutionized in the management of your inflammatory bowel disease. So it's going to improve the quality of life. What is the main therapeutic goals? Always remission, induce the remission maintain the remission, quality of life, show the endoscopic response, show the histologic response, improve the nutrition, improve the growth, development, correction of management. Very simple, looks to be, but how severe, how complicated to tackle. And we need to counsel the patient. Every dose, you need to bond it to the patient. That is what's the important trigger. Once of the one, that's the main area to address. That's a difficult task to do most of the time when you're going. So recognizing the complications, coexisting extra GA manifestation, all those things you need to do very effectively. That is why all one week or 10 days of discussion for inflammatory bowel disease won't be suffice. New list of discussions still, still happening, starting from your basic steroid till your fecal microbiota transplantation. So many things being considered for your you list of amamentarium with your biological support in the management of your inflammatory bowel disease. Apart from that, the early intervention to reach the target is, as I discussed, the basic things, the same slide is repeating, and onset your diagnosis as well as in early phase. You need to control the disease damage, and then you need to prevent the window of opportunity should not get missed out to prevent this worsening of events to take on. As I don't know, as I discussed, always when you're going to use your biologics and anti enough, you need to be very cautious with your infections, your malignancies, your renal carcinomas, lymphomas, melanomas, your art failure, some patients may report, your neurological events like your GBS, your multiple sclerosis, people are there to report, and immunosuppressed. You should be very cautious and contraindicated. And apart from that, old age more than 65, you should be very cautious for your anti TNF. And when we should use your biology, the usage, the right time, not too early or not too late. Earlier is better for patient with bad prognostic markers. If the calprotectin level is significantly more than 200, if it is going high, CRP if it is more than 40, 50, 50, if it is going to be high, ESR is going to be high. At that point of time, the patient's clinical scenario, if the patient, uh, if the CRP is going to be more than six, if this 
if the inflammatory casket is chill progressive, if the, the clinical scenario is worsening, fever, leukocytosis, other counts is going to be If you're going to suspect evidence of worsening of events, uh, early is always better for patients with bad prognostic marker, the right dose and time interval for your induction, your maintenance phase of regimen, and changing the dose as per the clinical dose as required. Some patient, you are going to start the patient on renal. I mean, for example, if you are going to start a patient with your adalimumab support, I have given a patient for one and a half to two, almost a one year of duration of adalimumab, two patients, three patients have tried. And what was the response? Some patients showed very good response. Some patients, the mucosal healing was down up to the mark. The clinical response, the nutrition, not up to the mark. So we are supposed to switch on to your adalimumab. But the criteria, you need to maintain the age criteria. It should be more than 18 years of old. Age is supposed to consider when you're going to consider your realism and other IM molecules when you're going to tackle with this kind of presentation. And the duration, not too short. Constant. So it should be in a prolonged duration, the serial follow. That is what is very important. And guiding the patient from mucosal ailing and the cost, not too long. Safety, complications, assessing and combining with the combo treatment is important when you're going to tackle this even. And when, we, when would we consider early biologic therapy in inflammatory bowel, hospitalization, the patient deserves hospitalization based upon your anemia, severe nutrition deprivation. At the point, you need to consider the patient bleeding PR and worsening of complications, severe persistent events, and you need to be very cautious. If the steroid is not going to respond, the patient developing steroid indicates induced complications. And uh, once the patient is going to be on steroid dependent, and if the patient is going to be intolerant to your steroids, so these are all the areas you need to get addressed. You need to be very, very cautious when you're going to tackle and severe markers like your CRP, yes, or your calc protective, always to be nuanced to be in the safer side and persistent activity in your endoscopy. That it's a huge burden for the patient, so you need to address it promptly. Always better to consider the patient for early biologic therapy for a patient with this kind of events to get, pre prevent the progression of disease. Apart from selection of your biologic therapy for your inflammatory bowel based upon your phenotypic events, your severity, your risk, your comorbidity, your overlap of presentation with extra GA manifestations. And if the patient is pregnant, you need to be very cautious and need of additional supports. Apart from that, efficacy, efficacy wise, your cost, all those things, frequency of dose, your patient preference and safety markers, clinical assessment, comorbid risk factors, all those things you need to see when you're going to tackle a patient with this inflammatory bowel disease as a, choosing them as a first line of biological therapy is very, very important. Apart from that, the drug development for IBD has become shorter and towards greater safety as well as efficacy. So now what they've been publishing, high efficacy, low toxicity is one of the most important things for your key products like your chikinumab as well as your venalizumab when you're going to consider based upon the papers what they've been quoted from 2015 onwards. So the key information will be, before I'm going to wind up, the key information, once you're going to tackle the patient with the various new list of molecules, so always starting from FIAC to your, till your venalizumab and other things, so earliest time to onset of clinical effect will be within one to two weeks, but the maximum mucosal healing within a span of six months, the patient supposed to show a reasonable mucosal healing at that point of time. So serial follow with your colonoscopic as well as your endoscopic interventions and recognizing the complications as a whole and addressing the patient effectively is very important when you're going to tackle with this kind of molecules in inflammatory bowel disease cascade of treatment. Monitoring the process while the patient on biologic therapy. So the basic one, what I've been discussed, regular follow, proper blood result interpretation. When you're going to start on, for example, your pinoin based derivatives. So when you're going to give the patient with azotaprine, be very cautious. So monitor the counts and all those things and look for the inflammatory markers like your cal protectin as well as your CRP as well as your ESR. And documentation is very, very important. See so your follow up and plan the patient again and stepping up and stepping down regimen, stepping this dose of steroids and looking for the complication of steroids and other presentation and comprehensive review the patient once every six months. That's not, as per my opinion, every month you need to review. Once a patient shows evidence of induction and maintenance therapy has been progressed, if the patient shows evidence of mucus ailing, then we can slowly progress yourself to two to three months once, but always initial phase, 
be very cautious, look for the presentation promptly, screen the patient for any infections if the patient is landing up, always do a x-ray chest to look for coexisting tuberculosis and vaccinate the patient for three major things. One for your zoster, your immunoglobulin support. Apart from that, your uh, I mean, uh, pneumococcal vaccine is supposed to be your PPSV along with that. Your flu vaccination should be the basic initial presentation of molecule and uh, I mean, maybe basic initial vaccination protocols to be initiated before you're going to consider the patient with your biologic support. And for your safe thiopurins, for this is what the basic implication, so many other minor suppression, your malignant changes, skin cancers, your pancreatitis, and GI intolerance, hepatotoxicity. There are some papers that are there to prove that. So that's why the safety implications is not up to the mark. And you're considering your tofacitinib, so the risk for shingles will be in slightly in the higher phase. When you're going to know patient discontinued to fasten the phase three uh, clinical development program for UC due to uh, episodes. So if you're going to look into this paper, well, what has it been trying to say that? So when you're going to use to fasten so that might be evidence for the patient to probably the evidence for shingles. So you need to be cautious. So episodes risk, cardiovascular risk, and your lipid levels may get altered, your blood counts may go down, your creatinine kinases may go high, infections may develop, your perforation risk is there, GA perforation around malignant changes is there, and like non melanotic skin cancer. So, positioning of the fast name. So, you can form the patients around failure to convention therapy, anti TNA failures, preferred oral dosing, acute flares. And combination with relizumab, extra GA manifestations, risk of episodes. So this is what the questions you get addressed because these are all the areas will be very complicating when you're going to tackle with this your tough acid. So vaccination, I told you three major things, your pneumococcal influenza as well as your zoster for your immunoglobulin support, your recombinant vaccination, all those things ought to be addressed. And anti tnf based therapy has been associated with increased risk of infection. This will be initially discussed. So if you're going to give anti tnf monotherapy or combination, so what is the risk of serious infections or opportunistic or viral and bacteria? Always will be you in enhancing mode when you're going to use in combination therapy. So always you need to be cautious. The best line is the patient's showing out of response. So always the balance along with recognizing to whom you're going to address is very, very important when you're going to check it. Lower rates of serious infection, definitely when you're going to use verilizumab, there are some papers to prove that. So this is what the paper just been taken into the code. And when you're going to use for a period of time, the serious adverse events with your verilizumab uh, will be definitely well controlled uh, when compared to your infliximab or oralimumab in the armament of your management protocol. And infliximab and verilizumab, Rank I for induction of clinical remission in biological naive patients of your UC. So always the remission, if you want to induce that, infliximab is well good, but multiple risk of infection are complications. So you need to address that. So valizumab will be a reasonably good response for a therapy. That's why our area of interest to consider that. And rank I as first line of therapy for induction of your clinical remission with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis patient. So how you communicate with patients on biologic support, multidimensional aspects of patient-physician relationship in the management of, I believe mean, it's an interesting paper. We are going to look into that. So communication has to be promptly ensured and counseling the patients to be promptly ensured when you want to address this event. And choice, as I discussed, verilizumab definitely slightly the higher side when you're going to consider your TNF. Apart from efficacy-wise, you see will be always on the higher side when compared to your Crohn's. And the most of the time, Crohn's will be more and more chronic presentation because of multiple complications and the to full of involvement. And the durability of your response and your immunogenicity, your safety profile, and your cost, all those things will be slightly in a better way when you're going to consider your velizumab and other things. And uh, which biologic agents choose this when Ulcerative colitis, if it is a steroid dependent in induction, all these three can be tried, but the best one for your maintenance will be verilizumab and acute colitis, not much of recommendation. Start with your 
infliximab in acute severe with your worsening of events and infliximab will be the safer side apart from your induction and maintenance for your Crohn's. Uh, infliximab early, but induction phase, not much of recommendation for maintenance. Always the best one will be your metalizumab support. And the ease of administration will be predominantly as uh, subtreatment mode of therapy will be the best one for Adalimba, but for other molecules, you need to go for intravenous support. That's one thing you need to get addressed. But the chances of infection, if you want to get controlled, always the best one. And the duration of therapy, interval also will be the best one for your Adalimba when you're going to compare your Adalimba therapy. Apart from that, the pros and cons, all those things already, I think, have been discussed. So the most important thing, and you're going to target your valizumab. So the gut specific, as well as your profile safety, low immunogenicity, and these are all the pros and cons always. The thought to slow on sort of action because we need a foster response in the initial phase when you're going to consider. Apart from that, your entity you know, multiple risk of infections and your uh, tofacit name, if you are going to the gene JIC inhibitors, if you are going to consider, so the risk of pulmonary embolism, your DVT, your shingles, as well as pregnancy reports outcomes are not well documented when you are going to use your tofacit name or a period of time. And this is what the recommendation strategy started from your tree to target, your strike position statement, which has been taken for 2019 guidelines for your CD as well as UC. So what they're going to say, assessing the severe diagnosis, response for clinical as well as mucosal ailing, monitor the patient serially over every three to six months, and resolution of bleeding manifestation, and endoscopic yielding of your ulceration, and look for your coexisting adjunct biomarkers like what I've been discussed with you all, and show the resolution of clinical symptoms and inflammation, which defines the remission is the goal of treatment when you're going that the treat to target strategy based upon your stride position statement. And everything starts from the beginning. Right patient, right time, and right way is the most important thing. Choosing the patient promptly, recognizing the patient early phase, and to whom you're going to consider, even if the best line of molecules, if the patient is well accepted, so always start with the high line of therapy rather than considering the basic always protocol. Because in 2023, the most important thing addressing the patient effectively with the minimum molecules and serial assessment for the response and tackling the infection, tackling the presentation and control and bring a good response for your endoscopic, your histological, as well as your clinical representation, improve the nutrition status, improve the growth, as well as prevent the retardation to get problem, prevent the infection to get augment, and take care of the vaccination regimen. All those things are very important. Why are biologics not indicated early? Because what is the initial things, what even discussed, the reasons for delay, because the patient will be over worrying, why we are going for the higher line of therapy, lack of efficacy is there or not, what is the next line of therapy, whether the patient is a surgery, the challenges, these are all the worriness. Most of the time, the worriness will be the predominant factor will be the injury from you to do for the higher line of therapy. But once the patient is not responding to this molecule, what am going to happen then? That is what the most of the patients will be worrying. A steroid addiction, so easy to prescribe, used to maintenance. So all those things, is very complicated scenario to maintain. So that's why in the initial phase, most of the physicians, even for the gastroenterology, will be in the always in the dynamic mode to initiate the patient with your biological support. That's what the question. But now the scenario has been completely changing. Over. Like a rheumatologist, now the gastroenterologist is going high with your biologics based upon the clinical presentation. And next to that, the limitations as I discussed with of your conventional therapy and healthcare perspective point of view, 5 AC is not going to be a very good potential for your mention, but as effective maintenance therapy, only in 30% of the population. Steroids efficacy is long-term, do not have long-term efficacy and risk of infections, your immunomodulators and major side effects, your healthcare response, the cycle of steroids, all those things apart from that, these are all the goals not able to maintain promptly. So this is what the basic summary of your Vitalizumab data. As we all know, Histological response and transmural response for your Crohn's is very, very important. And see the symptomatic response, normalization, 
and decrease the level of fecal calprotectin and endoscopic drilling supposed to get maintain the quality of life and absence of disability and the various papers various trials starting from your Germany to your victory all those things what they're going to mention so you need to show your response so before concluding inflammatory bowel disease is one of the chronic event very traumatizing you need to be very cautious recognizing the patient effectively and addressing the patient in a prompt way early diagnosis early response early initiation of therapy and look for the various coexisting complication head to food serial monitoring and serial follow-up counsel the patient effectively that's a way to tackle and screen for infections and vaccinate the patient promptly and if the patient deserves, start with the higher line of molecules based upon the clinical event of progression. That's a way for you to tackle this inflammatory bowel disease as per 2023 statement is very, very important. With this, I'm happy to rest my presentation. Thank you all for patient listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us a wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, sir, there are some questions in the chat box. Sir. Uh, can I ask the question, sir? Yes. Uh, the first query is... Uh, What's your short-term and long-term target in uh, IBD management with Biologic, sir? See, always a short-term target will be your clinical response. The patient has to respond clinically. Only when the patient eyes visualizes a finding, that is the short-term response. Usually, once you're going to initiate any patient of Biologic support, the short-term response will be the three major indicators. One, the bleeding manifestation, painful manifestation, or uh, the patient will be having diarrhea presentation. So these three areas, or if the patient is having other coexisting complications, so extra GA manifestations. So these three areas you need to address before you're going to consider the patient. Apart from that, the long term, always the histological healing, but it will take a time duration. Some patient may go for six months, some patient may go for years, some patient may not happen, depends upon the severity and depends upon the molecule and depends upon the consultant and depends upon the patient manifest uh, clinical events. All those things is important when you're going to tackle this kind of presentation. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the second question is, how long we need to continue or shift or taper the therapy, taper the therapy if the patient is showing good response over a biologic, sir? Ideally, ideally, no proper guidelines when to stop, when to stop. But most of the papers, what they've been considering, once you start the patient, if the patient is showing some sort of response to the patient, clinical events, if they, ideally you need to continue for a period of 52 weeks. But to whom we deposed to uh, deserve a second line of molecule, because if the patient doesn't show evidence of your endoscopic healing, at least 52 times. Uh, at least 30 to 50 percent of the endoscopy really has not been attained at that point of time over a period of six months of therapy is ideal to switch on and if the patient is being worsening with your monoclonal antibodies if you're going to initiate the patient on biological support and the patient is going to have worsening of events at that point you need to switch on so all these pointers is very very important but minimum duration cascade for a duration of at least six months of therapy to start with 300 milligrams of vitalizumab, six weeks interval, and all eight weeks of interval when you're going to use. So serial follow-up is matters. Six months of uh, serial, uh, ideally the guidelines, what they've been mentioning, within one to two months, you'll be having a response. But clinically, when you're seeing the patient as a whole, overall parameters, it will take more and more time. At least six months of the initial phase you need to take on before considering the patient or second line of molecule if the patient doesn't land up with anything, any major life-threatening presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the third question is, while putting one patient into biologics, what should be the first priority, either safety or efficacy, sir? Always the first priority would be safety. Safety is the first priority. Efficacy is the second one. Because the safety, if it is not going to address properly, your life cannot be sustained. The sustainability of life you can maintain only by safety. Only the safety is that. So that's why I give it a classical example. You have been suddenly a patient on steroid support, worsening, rapid infections, missed out, and the patient succumbed. And the patient underwent a total colectomy, surgical intervention. Even then, the patient succumbed. And our experience with this kind of events is definitely in the highest side. See, I'm not feel bad about that, but that's a learning curve. Only when you do mistakes, we can able to learn. So that's why I would like to, but because inflammatory bowel is by experience, only by experience, only by case, various presentation when you're going to see, when you're going to address, that's the area you can gain your knowledge, but no one can able to accept that. You have been super knowledgeable in tackling this kind of inflammatory bowel disease because over a duration, chronic 
counsel, everything is important for tackling this event. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, can a biologic therapy be a complementary with the conventional treatment during induction, sir? Always. It's short for pediatric age group. Always. It's a com not, not for the complementary. It's a primary line of support. So to prevent multiple serial adverse events. But for example, if you're going to consider a child of around 8 to 12 years of the age, so I need to start with element of support. Most of the time, if the patient is going to have moderate to severe UC or Crohn's, whenever you're going to press it, but you don't consider as a complementary therapy. It's line of the first line of therapy most of the time you're going to consider. But as I discussed, assessing the patient as a whole, tackling the infections, vaccination, protocols, counseling, financial burdens, Indian status, all those things have to be established when you're going to address this kind of uh, events based upon the age, nature, coexisting presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how long would it take to get a histological remission in ulcerative colitis and uh, transmural, uh, transmural healing in uh, Crohn's disease while a patient is on biologic, sir? Minimum duration of six months, but transmural healing will be taking some patient will be around one to two years of therapy needed. Mm -hmm. But six months of regimen, most of the patient will be showing transmural healing will be having evidence at least one year of duration of therapy to be considered. Thank you, sir. The last question is, uh, how do you apply treat to target approach in your practice, sir? Treat to target approach is not only for me, it's for the entire community of gastroenterologists to get approved. And the treat to target is always, as I discussed, the three major spheres endoscopic, histological, and clinical. First is clinical, always, because that is the one which will make the patient to establish the level of confidence. Second one is your endoscopic, and third one, your mucosal your histological response. So this is what the basic thing, but the street to target is our long-term goal as per the strike position statement, we need to maintain effectively. That is what to be considered when you're going to manage a patient with your inflammatory bowel disease. Thanks a lot, sir. I think there are no other questions in chat box also, sir. So we can conclude now, sir. First of all, thank you, sir, for coming in your busy schedule and giving us a wonderful presentation and uh, clearly making all the ga gastroenterologists, even PGs have attended today's meeting. So clearly about the biologics and IBD. So thank you once again, sir. And uh, I also want to thank all the participants who have participated today. And uh, I think this has been a good learning for you all. So thank you once again, sir. Uh, uh, good night, sir. Thank you very much, Team Takita. And also thank you for the participants for being here. Thank you all. Thank good night, you. sir.